Good day, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Kraft Heinz Company First Quarter Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, please press star 1-1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Anne-Marie Magella, Global Head of Kraft Heinz Investor Relations. Thank you, and hello, everyone. Welcome to our Q&A session for our first quarter 2024 business update. During today's call, we may make forward-looking statements regarding our expectations for the future, including items related to our business plans and expectations, strategy, efforts and investments, and related timing and expected impacts. These statements are based on how we see things today, and actual results may differ materially due to risk and uncertainties. Please see the cautionary statements and risk factors contained in today's earnings relief, which accompanies this call, as well as our most recent 10K, 10Q, and 8K filings for more information regarding these risks and uncertainties. Additionally, we may refer to non-GAAP financial measures, which exclude certain items from our financial results reported in accordance with GAAP. Please refer to today's earnings release and the non-GAAP information available on our website at ir.crafthindscompany.com under News and Events for a discussion of our non-GAAP financial measures and reconciliations to the comparable GAAP financial measures. Before we begin the Q&A session, it gives me great pleasure to hand it over to our Chief Executive Officer, Carlos Abrams Rivera, for opening comments. Please, Carlos. Well, thank you, Marie, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So before we begin our Q&A, I'd just like to provide some perspective on our top-up session here at Kraft Heinz, our consumers. And while we've seen a notable uptake in consumer sentiment in the first quarter, there is a gap between high and low earners continues to remain wide, and it shows a clear and continuing bifurcation. So the lower income consumers are challenged with interest rates remaining high, gas prices elevated, and, and, and savings dwindling. So there's a clear pullback of restaurants spent by these lower earning households, especially in restaurants and convenience stores. These consumers instead are looking for value as they prepare more meals at home. So in contrast, there has been a meaningful growth in travel and accordingly an increase in hospitality and entertainment sales driven by the bounce back among the higher earners. And here at Kraft Heinz, we are here to meet the evolving needs and tastes of all consumers, whether they're looking for value in serving their family delicious meals at home or seeking culinary delights as they set out on new adventures. They can look to the iconic and trusted brands of Kraft Heinz. So for us, it's about having brands that are accessible and available to everyone. And I believe we're well positioned to serve all of these consumers for three primary reasons. One, because we're bringing innovative food solutions and faster than ever before. Two, because we continue to renovate our core brands for today and tomorrow. And three, because we have the best team in the industry, full stop. We're on track to meet our goals of generating two billion incremental net sales from innovation and the world is taking notice. As we were recently named one of the world's top 50 most innovative companies by Fast Company. But more importantly, we are expanding the choices we offer our consumers so that they don't have to sacrifice. Whether it's providing greater value through multi-packs, plant-based options such as our newly released Nutco Mac and Cheese, or expanding the choices in our iconic brands such as Zero Sugar Heinz Ketchup. Myself, I've been traveling around the world visiting with our employees, and they are consumer obsessed. Their sense of ownership, collaboration, and agility is so inspirational. I just want to say thank you to every one of them for their dedication. We are proud of our progress, but far from satisfied, as we continue focusing on serving these consumers and making life delicious for everyone. And with that, I have Andrew joining me, so let's open the call for Q&A. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, please press star 1-1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. 
To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 one, one again. One moment for questions. Our first question comes from Andrew Lazar with Barclays. You may proceed. Thanks. Good morning, Carlos and Andre. Morning, Andrew. Hi. Um, it looks like um, KHC is, is still losing share in North America retail, though, at a more modest pace recently. But in the Accelerate platform specifically, um, your remarks call out holding or gaining share in about 55% of this platform. I guess, would you expect this percentage to be higher given the, the disproportionate you know, allocation of resources to this platform? Um, I guess a little more detail on share trends within Accelerate would be helpful. And then um, you, know, you mentioned U.S. restaurants softening a bit. Are you starting to see any of that, you know, on the flip side, benefit at home eating for your, for your business? And, and if not, why, why would that be? Thanks so much. Yeah, so thank you, Andrew, for the question. Before I get into the accelerator, let me just at least give you a, a view of how I'm seeing so far the business performance. You know, if you look at the last five weeks, just to remove the noise of Easter, we actually have continued to see volume share improvement versus year to date, and we're holding dollar share at the same pace in the U.S. So that's at the macro level in the U.S. for our company. Now, if you look at accelerated platforms, we actually continue to outperform the other platforms. So far, we are seeing flat in dollar share and growing volume share by 0.2 points. And now let me just break the other two, and then I'll go back to Accelerate. We are losing share in Protect platforms, as we continue to see the impact of the decline in SNAP benefits. At the same time, I'm actually pretty excited about the renovations we are seeing in these brands, because we are going to be continue to bring more consumer preference options as we go into the rest of the year. In our balance part of our portfolio, we are losing share, but improving versus year to go versus year to date, primarily driven by coffee. Now, to your question about accelerated platforms, there's a couple of big brands that are in there that I would like to unpack a little more. If you think about our mac and cheese business, which is within the accelerated platform, what you're going to be continue to see is one, we are going to start lapping a lot of the headwinds from Snap. Mac and cheese was probably one of the more categories that was more actually impacted by Snap. And as we go into Q2, beginning now in May, you'll see a plethora of new innovations from gluten-free to new options on, on flavors on our mac and cheese business, as well as some new exciting things for the category with some new SKUs that we're bringing in the second half of the year. If you look at the other parts of our accelerated platform, that includes our condiments. And in the condiment side, what I would say is our category actually is expanding. So we are growing and we actually grow in volume share. So for us, it's how do we continue to drive this growth within that category that has the right tailwinds behind it? And you'll see us continue to expand on the number of offers and innovations in we go into year to go. The one note that may be also helpful to understand in that accelerated platform is also we also got out some, some non-strategic business, uh, in particular our Heinz bulk vinegar, which it was a business that for us in terms of the economics didn't make us more sense. So we also exited that in the first quarter of the year. So hopefully that gives you a sense how we think about accelerate within the context of our, our company. I think the second part of your question is on an away from home business. And I think, you know, let me just say that right now, as I mentioned some of the prepared remarks, we are seeing some of the slowing of the restaurant traffic in the U.S., which you know, in some of it is impacting our business, but also some of the impact that we saw in the first quarter was due to us exiting some low-margin businesses, you know, um, as, we, as we think about it, making the right choice for the overall P&L. The actual the exit of the business was about $50 million in the first quarter, and that's going to be similar throughout the rest of the year. Now, for us, as we believe, as we go forward, we actually believe that it's about us continuing to drive the importance of away from home in new channels. I mentioned in the opening remarks that we're also seeing great opportunities in terms of travel and, and, our, and leisure, and that's an area where our teams are both focused because of only growth, but also because it allows us to expand margins into those areas. And we also are seeing improvement in terms of distribution of our core businesses as we go into, the, into Q3. So, again, I feel very good about away from home. I think that the trends will continue to improve. And at the same time, for us at Kraft Heinz, we have the scale to make sure that 
no matter where our consumers are shopping at, at hotels, whether they're going into restaurants or at home, that we have the distribution opportunity for us to kind of make sure that we are there to service anywhere they are. Thanks, Thanks for your question, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for questions. Our next question comes from Ken Goldman with J.P. Morgan. You may proceed. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Um, you okay. mentioned uh, hi. You mentioned inflation um, in your comments in a few areas. Um, I guess two questions here. First, I don't think you updated us. Forgive me if I missed it, but I think last time you were talking about maybe 3% cost inflation for the year. I'm just curious if that's still a reasonable number. And then, you know, I guess second, more broadly, you know, there's been a lot of attention paid to cocoa, obviously, but coffee inflation has been fairly notable as well. And I'm just curious, right, even though historically coffee is somewhat of a pass-through category, um, do you think that if you and your competitors need, um, you'll be able and, and even willing to raise prices to customers as much as you typically might hear? Or, or do you maybe expect a little more, I guess, pushback than usual? Thank you, Ken, for the question. Let me, let me just okay, let me start and then I'll ask Andrew to continue uh, to build on it. You know, for us, we are certainly committed to continue to provide families with affordable options. So, and that means <laughs> something that we take very seriously. And if you think about 2023, we did end the year with a 3% inflation, but we only passed about 1% price into consumers. So we do that very, very much intentional in a way for us to make sure we are all doing everything we can to offset things so that consumers don't see it. Now, Andre, if you want to comment a little more in terms of what you see in terms of cost inflation today and the coffee category. Sure. Good morning, Ken. So, yeah, we, we we still expect inflation to be in the low single digit territory, like we said before. So nothing has changed in that regard. Uh, with inflation a bit more concentrated in Q2 and Q3 than in the shoulder quarters, uh, and that's primarily because of the what you call the big three commodities: uh, cheese, meat, coffee, which we are seeing particularly in, in meat and cheese a uh, higher level of inflation happening in Q2 and Q3 as you are lapping very uh, favorable comps from from last year. Uh, so, yeah, so, so we don't see any other uh, meaningful change here. And our, the price that we've been taking is very surgical around those categories that have been suffering the, the largest impact. As I say, cocoa, uh, luckily, uh, is not a relevant part of our portfolio at all. I mean, a little bit in in, in Netherlands, but beyond that, there's, there's nothing of worth mentioning. And we don't see any, any reason to believe at this point that we will not be able to continue to pass through the prices in those commodity categories like has always been the case. So. All right, thank you. And if I could ask a quick follow-up, um, just the, the increase in gross margin guidance coupled with no other changes, you know, implies a bit higher SG&A than you previously expected. So just assuming that's accurate, are there any key areas in operating expenses we should think about that are maybe a little bit higher than planned, obviously not a huge amount, um, or maybe the plant shutdown is the primary, I guess, culprit here, so to speak. Just trying to get a little color there, if we could. So, as you saw in Cagney, we are starting to deploy our brand growth system, which is the method that allows to continue to improve in, in our marketing and continue to strengthen our brands. And one of the components of the brand growth system is ensure that you have the sufficient level of marketing across the portfolio. And we're starting to see a few selected areas where we need to step up market investment, thinking on the long term, and we have been gradually approving incremental investments on top of what initially planned on, on the marketing side in particular, which I, which I think is a, is a great thing for us. That's all. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. One moment for questions. Our next question comes from Brian Spillane with Bank of America. You may proceed. Hey, th uh, thanks, operator. Operator, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I just had two two questions. One, one, just uh, I guess a detail. Uh, can you share with us? I think in the past you've shared with us how much the the snap um, you know issue has, has impacted organic sales. So, do, do you have that for the first quarter? Look, it's never it's never. <laughs> 100% precise, we're talking about a macroeconomic model. 
but uh, we estimate on the U.S. retail business like in the range of 200 bips in negative impact. Okay, thank you. And then I, a question on, on the away from home in the U.S. and um, the deceleration, and again, you've quantified the, the, the impact of the plant closure, but just can you give us a sense of how much the, um, the, the, the how, I'm sorry, the, the impact of the, the exiting the customer, but can you give us a sense of just how much of the, the decline um, is, is also related to, like, traffic at restaurants, um, you know, just trying to get a sense of the weighting of what's, what's actually driving the slowdown. And then also, as you look into the second half, right, where you're expecting, there's an expectation that there's going to be some recovery, just, just what, what underpins that? And I, and I say that in the context of, you know, as we're kind of going through earnings season, a lot of the restaurants have, you know, incrementally gotten worse or slower. So, you know, just is there maybe too much optimism baked into the back half uh, expectation for recovery when it looks like a lot of these restaurant companies are going down? Let me, let me start on the end if you want to kind of uh, build on that. Uh, and thanks for the question, Brian. You know, first of all, I, you know, I continue to feel very good about overall strategy globally about away from home. Again, it's a, it's a business that we are seeing continue to improve uh, outside the U.S. and even as we are seeing some of the slowing of the restaurant business here in the U.S. As I think about the second half, there are a few things that I think will will feel better as we go into this rest of the year, even in the U.S. here. You know, first of all, the, and we mentioned about this factor impact that we had to close for unplanned maintenance, in, and that's going to affect us in Q2, and that will be behind us as we go into the second half of the year. The second part is that we are also going to be expanding the number of clients in which you're going to find our portfolio. So there's a number of things that, you know, I cannot speak to the, today, but that we'll see as we go into Q3 in which we actually expand the distribution uh, of our products. And then the third part is that we are going to continue to drive the focus on us going into attractive higher margin channels. So, again, beyond the restaurants in places like leisure and hospitality and travel where we are actually seeing better, better performance because of the higher income consumer and us getting into those, into those channels in particular. And I think within that channel, we are seeing very successful programs around our high selection program and hospitality experiences that allow us to bring differentiated type of programs in an industry that until now we really haven't played that strongly. So, and then lastly, what I would say is this is an area where we're going to continue to drive innovation in a way from home. I mean, already you are seeing how we are taking our high remix machine and we're actually using that and planning it to work in the partnership that we have with Burger 5, which is now our first restaurant to debut our Heinz Remix, and that we're going to see that expanding as we go into 2024. So the idea is it's not only the fact that we're going to be present, but we're also going to continue to be innovative in both the channel and the type of products we're going to bring into those, into those channels. And, Andrew, anything else you could talk about? I don't think so. Thanks for the question, right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. One moment for questions. Our next question comes from John Baumgartner with Mizuho Securities. You may proceed. Good morning. Thanks for the question. You know, Carlos, you, you highlighted consumer stress as a theme, and, and I wanted to ask in North America where the volume declines are still more pronounced, things like you know mac and cheese, which we just detailed for Andrew, but also ketchup and juices. These are categories where private labels have been underpenetrated historically, and now you're seeing volumes growing a bit. Are you seeing anything different, whether it's new merchandising by retailers or new price sensitivity among consumers that's changing the dynamic in these categories at all? So I'm curious for your take on the pockets of private label share growth, and then maybe a follow-up. Are there any specific categories in U.S. retail where you're expecting material benefits from joint business plans or a reinvestment for the duration of, of this year? Let me thank you for that question. Um, first on the, on the on private label, uh, you know, first of all, you know, we are fortunate that we have such an iconic and beloved brands in our portfolio. And, and I think what you're seeing is that really we haven't seen much of a change in terms of our overall gaps versus private label. And, and I think for us, the benefit that we have had is that over the last two years, 
we have spent a significant amount of energy in continue to renovate our portfolio. And today, we certainly have in the U.S. renovated almost 100% of our portfolio to make sure that it continues to be relevant for today and tomorrow. And I think that that along with the fact that we are also very much focused on delivering great value to consumers. You know, we have to make sure that as we think about value, that it's not just about the price point. It's also about it's worth paying for. So that's why our focus on driving quality products in a way that is affordable and giving more consumer choices, that is also driving the overall value equation for for consumers. So so what you're seeing in the data is, you know, private label have been gaining share, but really they have stabilized and, and they're taking more share from other branded players. In terms of our, our JVP, that continues to be a strength of ours. That frankly, you know, it comes out with the fact that we have been building this trust and partnership with our key retailers that allows us to truly leverage the scale of our total portfolio in a way that, that help us to both drive our distribution of innovation as well as improve our overall performance and execution in store. Because of this partnership, we can do things in store that probably other peers cannot do. You know, whether that's you think about the when you think about the holiday season coming up now in the summer, we have the range of a portfolio that allows us to create truly differentiating and unique value promotions that other people cannot do. So it's something that that we continue to elevate and we continue to build on as we have strengthened our portfolio and the partnership we have with the key retailers. Thanks for Thanks, the question. Paul. Thank you. One moment for questions. Our next question comes from Steve Powers with Deutsche Bank. You may proceed. Yes, hey, good morning, guys. Thanks. Um, hey, Car Carlos, in the prepared remarks, you, you talked about the uh, unplanned maintenance that you had to take on one of your away-from-home plants. Um, it seems that you've resolved that issue and you expect um, the impacts to be isolated to the second quarter. But maybe just a little bit more details on, on sort of what transpired there, um, you know, any kind of root cause diagnostic and then, you know, just do you expect that to be a, a pretty quick bounce back um, in recovery in 3Q, or is the recovery going to be more spread across the back half? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, Steve. Yeah, listen, um, you know, it's not – I wouldn't I wouldn't not give you that much more information that I already shared. It was a, a temporary shutdown in our plan for that unplanned maintenance, now that particular factory was very much focused on our on our away from home business, and the, so those condiments are places that we cannot source from other places and much within our within our network of factories. So that's why, in particular, it created a little bit of a dissonance in the Q2 only. And Andrew, if you want to give a little more details on the impact in our what we see in the range of the portfolio for Q2. Yeah. So as we said in prepare remarks, uh, production has resumed and is gradually going back towards the, the prior level. Not there yet, but production has resumed. And, and that's why I expect the impact to be, we do expect production to be fully uh, back on track within the quarter. And then the impact on pop line, as we said, will be in the range of 50 to 100 bips to the total company growth, which is a function of how fast you can really bring the production fully up to speed. Thanks for the question, Steve. Thank you. One moment for questions. Our next question comes from David Palmer with Evercore ISI. You may proceed. Uh, two questions, thanks. Um, uh, first, to follow up on, on food service, it, what what is your general food service assumption going forward that, that underlies your mid-single-digit organic growth that, that you have planned for the year? Is that that you basically expect that, that current trends industry-wide and globally will remain at a similar level that you saw in the first quarter or improving from there. And then secondly, just Oscar Mayer, the beverage business, both were declining maybe mid-single digits or so in measure channels in the first quarter. Now, could you maybe talk about the challenges and general plans and prospects for improvement for each of those? Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, maybe, Andre, if you can comment on away from home and, and maybe I can build on the Oscar Mayer and beverage business. Yeah, so first, if you think about um, our second half, as you said, we expect to be on algo throughout the, the, the entire second half. 
And if you think about our three pillars of growth, first on emerging markets, uh, as you said, Q1 came in line with what we said will happen, mid single digit, primarily because of the shipment phase in Brazil. So as we head into Q2, we do expect emerging markets to be now very close or at our long-term algo, and in the second half fully on the on the long-term algo. So that's a point comes from that, roughly, maybe a little more. Uh, on the U.S. retail business, as a function of industry uh, in, improving gradually, volume continues to improve, all the innovation, renovation, Carlos mentioned a few examples, we do expect to be, uh, if not on algo, at least approaching algo, so that will, have, will be a, a big contributor for the improvement as we head into the second half. And then finally, on away from home, like we don't need to be fully on algo to deliver our numbers in the second half, and that's not what we're contemplating, so we don't expect away from home to be fully back on algo, even though on the international side we should be um, back there. In the U.S., where we think the dynamics of, of the industry is what gives us a pause, we do expect improvement and, and a great improvement on the industry, plus the business wins, but I mean, I think we're still a bit on a pause to see how much of the industry will recover. But again, we don't need to be fully on our own U.S. away from home to deliver our guidance for the second half. Yes. And then, you know, just going to dig deeper on the Oscar Mayer and beverage question, David. I, but I would say, if you go back to our Carnegie presentation, those are businesses that are in two different portfolio roles within our company. So our beverage business is within our protect business, in which we actually are allocating resources in order to protect the profitability through the renovation across those brands to drive the growth. So if you think about our, some of the key brands there, you see that our meal liquid concentrate, in which we actually just renovated our entire kind of design or product, we have a new uh, campaign, a marketing campaign, focused on the wellness of the brand can offer. If you think about Crystal Light, we just debuted our first major innovation in 10 years, and we're launching a number of new and exciting functional benefits. If you think, and then for us is how do we continue to drive that sense of focus on re and reno renovating on those particular products because we know they are differentiated and we think they are well positioned for the long term. In the Oscar Mayer, it's part of our balanced business, which again we are making sure we're making the right investments in order to protect our distribution, and at the same time we also are are being thoughtful about how we are going to manage, you know, a business that are very exposed to the commodity side of things. So we are being also uh, thoughtful of making sure we are protecting the top line, while at the same time making sure we have the right growth margins management in order for us to make it work within the entire uh, Kraft Heinz portfolio. Yeah, the only thing I read on the balance portfolio as a whole, you, you saw in prepare remarks uh, that the overall the balance declined 4% in the quarter. Uh, but the, the gross profit dollars grew 5%. So as you have said before, we continue to, it's a balancing act, and we continue to make sure that we, we don't starve those brands off the, the core investments to sustain their business, but we should not expect uh, an average growth coming from there. Great, thank Operator, you. We have, Operator, we have time for one more question. Thank you. One moment for our last question. Our last question comes from Robert Moscow with TD Cowan. You may proceed. Hi. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, Andre, I think you, you might have already answered this, but mathematically, I think the guidance now for food service um, it implies a, a 50 basis point reduction to the overall company compared to, I think, the high single-digit guidance you had last quarter. So. Does, does the rest of the portfolio need to offset that? Is anything, are you expecting anything to be a little better than you expected, or is it, is it just kind of absorbed? And, and then secondly, um, I think the slide said that you, you know, you're, you're seeing improvement in retail trends in, in U.S. retail. Um, maybe that's just versus a year ago. But can I assume that, um, you know, d despite the market shares being, you know, down versus a year ago, that the, do you need to make any big adju any adjustments to your marketing plan for 2024? Is there any increased price investment or or advertising investment that needs to be made uh, that's different from what you expected? Thanks. Andrew, you want to start with away from home, and I can comment on the retail trends. Yeah. So good morning, Rob. Um, first, 
as you said, the, the 50 bips that we mentioned in preparing marks, I should be clear, is linked, the 50 to 100 bips linked to the plan shutdown and is focused on the second quarter. So we, we do not expect impact from that as, as we go into the second half. Um, so as we head into the second half, as I said uh, before, we do expect emerging markets to be fully back on algo. Uh, we do expect uh, the U.S. retail, North America retail, to continue to improve. Like improve in Q1, we expect to improve more in Q2, and then and then more in the second half. Like as a function again of lapping, the snap, and a lot of contribution from innovation and renovation. And on the way from home, uh, we do expect uh, the rest of the world to gradually improve and get close, if not at algo. Um, and then the U.S. becomes the, then the question where. We don't need to be at mid-single digit in the second half for us to achieve our our guidance, uh, but we do expect a gradual improvement on industry, uh, and I think we have, we have seen that from different sources as well. I think that there is a general expectation of that, uh, together with all the business wins that we have done, uh, and I think then we're, we're, we're going to be past the situation with the plant as we had in the second half. On the, thank you, Andre. And the, on the retail trends, you know, I guess I'll, I'll go back to the point in the beginning, which is we are seeing the volume share improvements versus in the last five weeks with the year to date. So we are seeing that the momentum is, is happening already. And for us, you know, what we are going to be doing is focus on those things we can control, which is as you go into the year to go, you'll see us continue to drive the renovation of our brands, like I mentioned, whether it's in our protect platforms and accelerate which is driving more innovation, as you'll see now, beginning now in Q2, as we continue to step up through the rest of the year, and then be smart in our marketing investments. Andrew mentioned earlier that part of the reason we're taking some of those growth margin dollars and investing back in the business is because now we are deploying a brand growth system that allows us to think about how do we make sure we're being smart about where to spend and places that maybe we haven't been spending at sufficient levels. So you are, in fact, going to see that continued focus on not driving the right dollars against the right priorities for us to drive the retail growth. And thank you for the question, Rob. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. This concludes our earnings call for the first quarter, 24. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes the conference. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.